Good evening and Erev Tov. My name is Mandy Winston and I am the Chief Executive of UJIA, UK's premier Jewish charity connecting the UK Jewish community with Israel, both for our work supporting underserved communities in Israel and bringing the experience of Israel to our community here in the UK. Over the past few difficult months, UJA has successfully created a huge amount of Israel-related online content, allowing thousands, especially families and young people, to experience Israel virtually, even if they couldn't leave their homes. This evening, however, is an absolute highlight, and we are thrilled that Sir Ronald agreed to UJA's invitation to discuss his crucial new book and visionary work. When you hear about Sir Ronald's work and the way he's transforming philanthropy, and our society, one cannot help but feel proud, inspired, and moved to action. For the past 100 years, UJIA has been working to strengthen Israel. In living memory, we have been working tirelessly to ensure all Israelis have access to the education and the employment opportunities they need in order to participate in the Zionist dream. But several years ago, influenced by the work of Sir Ronald, we realized that the traditional approach to philanthropy was simply not enough to drive transformation. And so we launched SI3, Social Impact Investment in Israel. The three I's relate to impact, investment, and Israel. SI3 is a cutting edge, sustainable and evergreen approach to philanthropy that drives social change in Israel by funding projects that provide high value social impact and financial returns, while tackling long-standing social issues such as minorities in work and employment in the periphery. Let me give you a personal example. Before I moved to London at the end of last year to serve UJA, I lived with my family in a remote development town in the Negev called Mitzpeh Ramon. Known for the area's natural beauty, its remoteness also means that the diverse community of 3,000 plus people suffers from high rates of unemployment. Many people really struggle to make ends meet. A five minute walk from my former home, SI3 is investing in Midbar Chaisre, Desert 19, a social startup located in the former industrial zone that creates stable employment for dozens of women who provide remote financial and bookkeeping services. SI3 via Desert 19, change many, many lives. And in the post COVID-19 world, these types of investments will be ever more critical. And in the UK, SI3 is proving itself to be a creative way of engaging funders who have not previously directed their philanthropic efforts towards Israel and to engage young British Jews in a meaningful relationship with Israel. To date, just under one million pounds in investments have been approved. We have a portfolio of 10 investments we are currently closing on two new investments, both focused on bringing minority communities into the high-tech employment sector. None of this would have been possible without our amazing investment committee, led by Grant Curland from Bayport Finance, who has huge experience in global development through social finance. We also receive incredible support from our 40 members of the SI3 Advisors Committee, all of whom are young professionals working in finance, who give of their time and of their passion to work on the due diligence of all our potential investments, including 70 applications last year. And last but not least, UJ has been so fortunate to benefit from the expertise of Dahlia Black, who has the honor of interviewing Sir Ronald tonight. UJ has ambitious growth targets for SI3 for the coming three years. And so I hope that Sir Ronald's story and vision will inspire you to take up our invitation to join us in this work and to make a difference to communities in Israel that need our help the most. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, and I'd now like to hand over to Louise Jacobs, Chairman of UJA. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. I'm absolutely delighted to have Sir Ronald Cohen with us for the event this evening. Sir Ronald really leads little or no introduction having been the global pioneer of impact investing, driving private capital to serve social and environmental good. He is chairman of the Global Steering Group for Impact Investment and chair of the Portland Trust Group. He is also co-founder of Social Finance 
UK, USA and Israel and co-founder chair of Bridges Fund Management and Big Society Capital. Previously, Sir Ronald co-founded and was executive chairman of Apex Partners Worldwide. He is a member of the Dean's Advisors at Harvard Business School and vice chair of Ben Gurion University. Impact is Sir Ronald's third book and has been met with wonderful acclaim. Having known Sir Ronald for many years, I feel privileged that he is speaking to us tonight and never has it seemed so relevant than during this current time, where once again in this pandemic, the people worst hit will be the most vulnerable in our societies. Never has it been more important to ensure that we create maximum positive social impact on a global scale. This talk is very pertinent and we thank Sir Ronald who is speaking to us this evening from his home in Israel for joining us. Sir Ronald will be interviewed by Dahlia Black, founder and principal at Weave Impact. Weave focuses on implementing social impact strategies across all asset classes in Israel. We are delighted that Dahlia has been working with us at UJIA for many years and she manages our SI3 portfolio in Israel. Dahlia, I now leave this evening in your very capable hands. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise, and welcome everybody. And of course, good evening to Sir Ronald Cohen, who's sitting not so far away from me this evening in Tel Aviv. So Ronnie, it is indeed a very timely moment for the publication of your new book, Impact, a time where all of us, I think, are facing the hardest crisis of our lifetime. This pandemic, is deeping inequalities, education is suffering, and we are heading into what looks like very challenging financial times. And our governments, both those in the UK and here in Israel, are throwing millions, if not billions of pounds at trying to get us back to what is some sort of normal. And yet here in your book, you talk to us about an alternative view, a different normal that places people and planet as priorities for investment. So let's jump straight in. Please, you know, can you share with the listeners the key message that you would like the readers to take away from your book? Certainly. Uh, good evening, Gedalia. Uh, thank you, Louise and uh, Mandy, for the kind introduction, and good evening to you all. It's a great pleasure for me to spend uh, an hour with you chatting about, um, about impact. The message of the book is that things cannot continue as they are. That our economic system has become so self-defeating now uh, that we're just digging a deeper and deeper hole for ourselves, uh, Dahlia. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, companies are creating such environmental and social damage that governments can no longer tax us sufficiently to be able to remedy them. And so the situation gets worse and worse. We're all aware of the climate crisis. We're all aware of the crisis that inequality is creating today. We've seen inequality erupt in, in violence uh, before COVID and during COVID. We saw it in, in France, in um, Chile, in the Lebanon. We've seen it recently in the United States. And so the proposition of the book is that our economic system has to adapt to our new situation. Over the 250 years of capitalism, it has served us well in its current form. But if we want to be able to solve the big challenges that we face, then we have to bring business and investment to provide solutions. To do that, we need to bring impact to the center of our economic system alongside profit. And we can do this in the 21st century because technology and data enable us to measure and to monetize the impact that companies have through their products, through their employment, and through their operations on people and planet. And so we want to shift we need to shift, we must shift from making decisions in business and investment on the basis of risk and return, 
only, to making decisions on the basis of risk, return and impact. Thanks, Rani. And we're going to delve into uh, each of the elements that you've just mentioned a little further. But just before we do that, and since we are on a call with um, both of our um, UK Jewish community, I did want to set the stage a little and, and put a slightly personal um, touch on our talk this evening. And, you know, you talk about inequality. And of course, Egypt is a country that uh, um, suffers uh, from inequality, um, like many of the countries in the Middle East. And the UK Jewish community welcomed you and your family as refugees from Egypt when you were only a little boy, 11 years old. And I believe that your father had to fight hard to get you a place at school. And of course, later in life, you had a scholarship at Harvard. How did these personal circumstances affect your choice for the for dedicating your life over these last few years to such a bold vision well I, I think Dalia it left me with a sense that uh, because I had been helped um, I had an obligation to help others and perhaps that was also uh, the values that um, my parents um, had uh, and uh, perhaps it's also the, the Jewish um, uh, view of uh, our responsibility to improve the world, tikkun olam. Uh, it's a blend of all those things. And it's probably also the fact that when I was at university, um, it was an idealistic time, uh, rather like uh, the current millennial generation. And uh, we had the feeling that uh, we could improve the world and that we would improve the world. So it's a blend of all these different things. So let's, um, let's delve into the book a little further. Um, you mention many times in the book, 1929, which as uh, we all know, there was a stock market crash. And I believe that most would still refer to 1929 as the worst economic event in history. And it led to an incredible shift where people started to take risk for the first time into account in their investment. And the most asked question by the audience was, is this the time for another shift? Is the pandemic going to create a system shakeup in perhaps a similar way that 1929 was a juncture in history, are we going to see that again now? I have a feeling we are, Dalia. What happened in 1929 is that uh, investors, after losing a huge amount of money, uh, began to realize that they had been investing in companies without understanding what profits they made. Now, this will astonish you all uh, on, on uh, this webinar, but um, in 1929, each company picked its own accounting principles. There were no auditors to verify the numbers and companies could squirrel away into hidden reserves, part of their profit, without telling uh, shareholders whether they'd done so or how much they had squirreled away. And yet at that time, uh, remonstrations uh, against uh, the proposal to bring general, um, generally accepted accounting principles in, in uh, Congress um, were strident that this would spell the end of American capitalism. Now we find ourselves today, after the crash of COVID-19, with a similar uh, quandary, we're at a similar crossroads. $30 trillion worth of investment is now going to companies that are seeking to achieve more than just profit. Environmental, social and governance investment seeks companies that are not creating harm and if possible that are doing good. Uh, there's 30 trillion of that. There's nearly a trillion now of impact investment where the impact is actually measured. So you have the same intention as ESG, but you measure the impact. And yet, what transparency do the investors 
bringing that 30 trillion, which is about a third of the amount that is professionally invested in the world, have on the impact performance of companies. It's like 1929 and profit. And so I believe there's a major opportunity now, and that is what I wrote in the Financial Times on, on Friday in my opinion piece, for this crisis to create uh, an opportunity for us to rewrite accounting to include impact. So let's let's perhaps stop there for a moment on the subject of impact measurement. And you actually dedicate a whole chapter to impact measurement in your book. Um, but if we're both honest, I think we can both admit that um, there's a huge amount of confusion at the moment in terms of impact measurement. There are no accepted norms. Um, it's a very, very difficult um, area to gain any sense of consensus. And you discuss accounting rules, and at the end of the day, it took decades for us to develop universal accounting rules. So it's a great concept in theory. I think we would all agree that we would benefit from having companies report on impact. But can this actually be implemented? And can it be implemented in the short term? Or is this a very long term view that we have to take? No, I think it's a short term. Uh, issue now, uh, Dalia. I think governments now have to mandate that uh, companies starting two years from now uh, begin to publish impact weighted accounts alongside their regular financial accounts. And if we do that, we're not postponing uh, the behavior change for companies because if companies, which are very much aware of their negative impact, become conscious that they're all going to be exposed to the um, harsh light of analysis, uh, then they will begin to change their ways of doing things now. And so I think it's immediate. Uh, we published last week uh, on the Harvard Business School uh, site. Um, if you look for impact weighted accounts, you will see the environmental impact of 1800 companies. Next year we will add to that their product impact and their management impact and we will show how you can give a total view of the impact performance of companies. Now if I said to you uh, that uh, and you probably well that let's take an example in the book if I said to our viewers uh, that uh, uh, fossil fuel companies uh, like Exxon Mobil, and I'm not in favor of investing in fossil fuels, but they're big polluters, created through its operations alone, without counting the pollution that comes from the use of the oil that it brings out of the ground, $39 billion worth of damage a year. And that if you looked at uh, Shell, which has uh, similar sales, it uh, created 23 billion of damage and BP created 13. Wouldn't those figures influence the way, if you want to invest in fossil fuels, that you looked at your investment decisions? And similarly, if you took chemical companies, you take a company like Sasol in South Africa and you compare its sales, which are $12 billion, with the environmental damage it causes, which is 17 billion, bigger than its whole sales. And you compare that with Solvay, European company, which has same sales, 12 billion, but creates $3.7 billion of, of damage. And then you look at BASF, another European company, it has five times of the sales, but it only has 10% of sales in environmental damage, 7 billion. Aren't those numbers that you want to know as a consumer or as an employee or as an investor? And I think what has changed the Dahlia is our understanding now of what can be measured in the social area as well. So take a great name like Intel. Uh, Intel 
uh, has 50,000 employees in the US and it pays them $7 billion a year. Now, we do say superficially, wow, that's fantastic social impact. But if you compare diversity around its facilities with diversity within Intel, and if you ascribe the salary levels for the missing people at every level of the organization from excluded communities, this contributes to reducing that $7 billion of apparently positive impact down to two and a half billion dollars. And Intel is a leader in pushing diversity and the well-being of its employees. Now, shouldn't all those figures exist for every company in the tech world? Shouldn't we be able to create a race to the top? And so I hope you can see that this is not a theoretical argument or a distant vision. This is something which can be done now, and it is being done now. So, again, you know, I, I think that we all agree, but to take us to the point of implementation, do you see a, the governments adopting impact regulation? You know, is that what we need? Is that the next step that the governments need to create clear guidelines, bring in a regulatory body, what is the practical step that needs to happen to for this to be implemented? Yeah. So interestingly, there's a bill just going through Parliament in the UK about environmental disclosure by, by companies. So these things ha are happening in, in, in real time. The debate around whether government should do it or whether you just follow the precedent with financial accounting, where we establish accounting boards, which were not government organizations, um, uh, to do the job. In my view, we've already had that debate. We had it in the early 1930s. I think you just want to replicate account an accounting board for impact accounting principles and the existing bodies that protect um, investors uh, we'll, we'll look over both the financial performance and the impact performance of, of companies and make sure that they are, you know, reported in, in, in the right way. The accounting firms will audit both the impact performance and um, the impact uh, weighted uh, financial accounts, just like they do the financial accounts. So we're not reinventing um, a wheel, uh, Dalia. So... Uh, Thank you. Um, if we, you know, you mentioned Intel and of course Intel has had huge investments here in Israel in the south of the country. And if we, if we take the conversation towards Israel, you mentioned in the book an amazing Israeli startup, an impact technology company called Orcam, that has developed a small wearable device that helps blind or visually impaired to understand their surroundings using artificial intelligence. In addition, you mentioned the Israel's social impact bonds, and of course you founded Israel's impact fund bridges and so on. And I've heard you, and many of us have heard you, actually refer to Israel as the impact nation, which I think is a very grand title for a very small country. Can you elaborate on this vision and is it realistic? Well, to be more accurate, I have said that we want to add to the title of startup nation, impact nation. Uh, I do think it's realistic. I think the combination of entrepreneurship, innovation, and tikkun olam, the desire to improve uh, the world, is a big uh, and unique uh, feature uh, of, uh, of Israel. Uh, obviously, it exists in other places, in other areas, and so on uh, you know, as well but it is deeply ingrained here. And when you look at uh, the social issues the world faces, um, you find them in microcosm within Israel. Uh, the inequalities, um, the uh, excluded um, uh, parts of uh, society that uh, UJIA is, is trying to help through impact uh, investment. And so, I can see a very powerful impact movement starting in, in Israel. Uh, the government here has been 
a bit pusillanimous about uh, seizing impact investment with both hands, but the pension regulator, uh, when Dorit uh, Salinger was pension regulator, came out with a very important new regulation that uh, pension fund uh, managers have to uh, disclose what they're doing in the impact investment uh, area. So I think we're I think we're capable of getting the government on side. The government has agreed to pay uh, for the educational outcomes achieved by Bedouin children studying maths in, in Rahat, as you, uh, as you know. Uh, and I hope when we're through COVID uh, that we can, we can, in fact, we should be doing it now during COVID in order to weather uh, the re recovery uh, phase. Uh, of COVID, so that it is it is not as bad as it uh, could well turn out to be. We could use the tools of impact investment to do this, but government's mind is focused on urgent rather than you know medium term um, considerations, and uh, we're doing our best to to get them to do both, uh, to worry about the urgent, but also to plan for the recovery and to build into the recovery, the social justice, which has to be a part of it. So you've mentioned government uh, here in terms of Israel and, and you, you do talk a lot about government in your book. And one could argue that the message in the book is really for those controlling the capital or perhaps global billionaires that you also do uh, mention in the book. Yet majority of the listeners uh, with us this evening do not fall into that category and although everyone is aware of the inequality of opportunities and of course the climate crisis it, is there a way for smaller investors to be a part of this conversation is there a place where listeners uh, this evening can have a role in trying to see your vision uh, come to fruition absolutely and uh, what i say in 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 the book um, is that each of us has a role to play in the impact revolution, which I think is going to be as important and extensive as the tech revolution which has preceded it. Uh, we can start doing so uh, as a consumer. Uh, consume the products of companies uh, whose values you share. Uh, we can work for companies whose values we share instead of uh, companies that are polluting or creating social issues. We can make our own investments in quoted companies that are uh, similarly, uh, you know, following ESG uh, uh, principles. Uh, there's plenty of information about these companies now, and even if the measurement of that impact is virtually non-existent today, there is quite a lot of reporting about what companies are, are doing. Um, many of us work for companies which have pension plans and we have uh, contributions that we make to the pension plan and that the company makes on our behalf. Uh, we can write to the managers of our pension plans uh, and, and ask what uh, uh, they are doing about investing in ESG and impact um, in investment. There's $38 trillion uh, of pension fund money in the world. If all those who are pension savers uh, were to start writing to their uh, investment uh, managers, uh, asking for details about their ESG and impact investment policies, it would change a lot of things, apart from government becoming aware of it and beginning to loosen the regulations, which have typically given an excuse uh, for uh, trustees uh, not to, to change uh, you know, long-standing ways of looking only at, uh, at uh, profit. Um, and then in the UK, uh, you have something called the social investment tax relief. You can invest in social impact bonds or loans to charities. Um, uh, so there are growing ways now uh, that you can put your money into um, driving uh, the improvement of lives and the planet. 
So I think that's a very call, a clear call to action um, for everyone on the line. And, and there are definitely retail banks, I know, especially in the UK, Barclays, for example, that now have um, impact investment products for small investors. So um, definitely gives us all something to think about. Now, if we were to focus on the traditional source of uh, those that drove social impact, which of course, philanthropy, philanthropists, you know, such as the UJA, yeah. um, you do discuss that also in your book. And of course, we have large foundations such as the Ford Foundation in the US or Guys and St. Thomas uh, Charity in the UK who are making very significant efforts to move their large endowments into more responsible investments like you've already mentioned. But what about the more modest philanthropists? Again, you know, wanting to speak very directly to um, those that are listening to us on the phone tonight. And, you know, just Louise, Mandy and UJA trustees take a deep breath. But Ronnie, are you suggesting that people stop making donations and turn their capital towards impact investments? Is, is there a role for philanthropy in your vision? Absolutely. And I mean, what I say in, in uh, the book, uh, Dahlia, is that um, what impact brings to philanthropy is, first of all, a focus on achieving outcomes uh, rather than funding activities. Um, traditionally, uh, if we've uh, wanted to help prisoners in jail, uh, we've given the money to organizations uh, which have uh, sort of committed to visiting the prisoner so many times a week or month and so on. Um, if you begin to shift that thinking to how many prisoners are you actually gonna prevent from going back to prison with 18 months, within 18 months of release and getting them into jobs, uh, that already begins to change the way we make decisions in philanthropy. The second thing I say in the book is pay for success is the key to the capital markets for a charitable organization. What does that mean? It means that if you're an organization that is dealing with prisoners, such as those I have just described, and you can sign an agreement with a philanthropy or with the government, uh, that you will be paid so much for every prisoner who instead of going back to jail gets into a job, all of a sudden you have a performance measure. And if you show you can perform against that measure, then the investors who backed you to try to achieve these numbers will give you more money. And I'll give you a really powerful um, uh, example. There's a, a young woman called Safina Hussein, which run, who runs a, a, a charity in India called Educate Girls. And her purpose is to prevent girls from dropping out of school uh, before the age of, of, of 12 uh, and keeping them in school, obviously, to finish their studies. She raised a, a very small social impact bond of a quarter of a million dollars to do this. Within the contract, uh, was written uh, a target. Uh, she beat the target by 160%. What happened? $100 million of philanthropic money uh, came to support her because the philanthropists know now that they can measure her performance and they can tell whether she's doing a good job. And so long as she's doing a good job, she'll be able to raise more money through social impact bonds or more money philanthropically. So it brings impact investment and impact thinking brings to, um, to foundations and to philanthropists this idea of you can give your money to pay for success. Now, I'm, I'm very much involved as chair of the Global Steering Group for Impact Investment, uh, the GSG, in catalyzing two $1 billion education outcome funds in Africa and the Middle East and in India to sign the sort of contracts we've been talking about. Now, through crowdfunding, every person on this call could make a contribution to this outcome fund or to a similar outcome fund in Israel as a philanthropist. 
And what you're doing by making a, a donation of this kind, you're giving the opportunity for the charitable organization that will sign the contract to raise more money in the future, just as a business would do. So the um, social impact bond, um, which started off as a way of bringing investment capital to charitable organizations, which had been dependent on donations previously, which typically meant that they stayed small and had no money, has now enabled a number of these organizations to raise investment capital. There are now social impact bond funds. Uh, you can invest in 30 or 40 social impact bonds in the UK, uh, tackling different social uh, issues. And then finally, for the very big foundations, Dalio, they have endowments, they're investing assets which have been donated to them and they're giving away the return. Typically, these endowments have been investing in uh, fossil fuel companies on the one hand and then giving grant money away to charitable organizations dealing with the effects of pollution, right? Which makes no sense at all. And what impact investment says is you've got to use all of your resources as a philanthropy to achieve the outcomes that embody your mission. And so you can't have this contradiction. If you believe uh, that uh, you must uh, use your grant money uh, to remedy certain ills, then your investment portfolio cannot encourage the perpetuation of these ills. On the contrary, it should be investing in companies that bring solutions to them. But I don't think that pay for success will ever be more than 10 or 20 percent of a donation uh, of a grant portfolio because there are many things that can't be measured in the charitable area. Um, you know, certainly in the arts, uh, terminally ill patients, uh, all of us can come up with a long list of uh, social interventions um, which, uh, you know, do not have uh, easy measurement. So I think what you're strongly positioning philanthropy is very much the catalyst for additional capital and uh, keeping a, a very strong uh, place there for philanthropy to really lead the way in terms of the uh, new impact investing models. And at this point in our conversation, Ronnie, since we have well over 250 listeners on the call with us this evening, and we were inundated with excellent questions, let's take a pause in our conversation to take some of the questions from the audience. And we do have a question from James Cummings, um, about endowment capital and what James asks is if you had a hundred million dollar endowment for a hundred percent impact related investment what percentage might you carve out for investments that have the ability to create higher impact but that are at risk of lower than market returns and has your answer shifted due to the elevated awareness of diversity, equity, and inclusion during this coronavirus pandemic? So I think it's a personal choice, uh, Dalia. Uh, I think if you're investing an endowment of uh, your family, um, you can choose uh, to pick investments that have a very high impact return and a, a somewhat lower financial return. That's perfectly acceptable. Uh, I think, though, if we want impact investment to spread, uh, we have to prove the proposition, which I'm a true um, a believer uh, in, that if you optimize risk, return, and impact, if you do good and do well through your investments, you will actually achieve a better return. And the reason for that is that you reduce the risk side of that uh, risk return impact equation, um, the risk of consumers and talent and investors walking away from you, the risk of regulation and taxation because you're polluting or doing socially unacceptable things. But you're also open when you put on an impact lens, you open 
the door to new sets of, uh, of opportunities. And you talked about Orcam, which is a wonderful company. As you say, it whispers this pair of spectacles of theirs, whispers into the ear of, of the wearer, the page of the book they're holding or the newspaper uh, or the, the banknote. It's read like a professional reader is reading anything that you pick up. It's quite remarkable. And we would all say that's a fantastic impact venture. 35 million blind people, 250 million visually impaired people in the world. Companies raised $100 million uh, of investment so far. The last round was at the $600 million valuation. We'd all say bravo. But if you're wearing an impact lens, and this is where the new sets of opportunities come in, you ask yourself the question, how can my technology do the most good in the world? How can it help the greatest number of people? And then, Dalio, you get a surprising answer. What if you gave these spectacles to the 800 million illiterate adults in the world? If you took them from not being able to read to being able to understand uh, what's on the page they're, they're holding, what would that do for their lives and livelihoods? What would they do for the, what would they do for their countries? What would it do for the world economy to bring 800 million people out of complete illiteracy to being able to read? You know? And so all of a sudden you have a market base of 1.1 billion people. And so I'm a firm believer that optimizing risk return impact will deliver better returns. And that's why it's going to be as disruptive as the tech revolution. When people opposed the tech initially, uh, they thought that uh, they could continue to make the same sort of profit without tech. Well, today, tech is the, the water on which every ship has to sail. And I believe impact will be another layer of water on top of tech on which every ship will have to sail. I think businesses that don't deliver impact that are in existence just to make money are going to do very badly. And I think businesses that show that they can manage to improve the world while they make money are going to do very well. And this new generation of entrepreneurs, many of whom are on this webinar today, is the generation that's going to make that happen. So if we're, we're talking about making money, we have a really great question here from Johnny May. He's asking, would you ever refuse a source of money for social impact investing? So I, I take the view that so long as the money that you raise helps people improve their lives and does not affect the way in which you behave, does not influence the way in which you act, uh, that it is fine to take it. Now, there's a line that has to be drawn somewhere. There are some people with whom you don't want to be associated, even if their money is going to, to do good, because there are all sorts of other implications. But broadly speaking, I'm in favor of defining projects that can accept uh, impact investment um, without uh, having to take all money to fund the, you know, the organization. Okay, and um, Mark Sherman from Manchester, he's asking, if your investment mandate only allowed for one impact sector to invest in, what would it be and why? I would invest in education. I would invest in education because I think uh, education is the biggest driver of social and economic mobility. We have hundreds of millions of uneducated people uh, in the world uh, and uh, the number is growing geometrically and if we don't do something about it the world is going to be a lot more unstable in the future that's one reason i would do it and then i think the tools of technology today increase the scope hugely for improving the way in which we educate people, train teachers, and, and so on. So you have the ability to use technology 
um, to deliver, you know, to do good and to do well at the same time. Okay, and to touch on another uh, impact focus on the real estate sector, Malcolm Sullivan has asked, what are your thoughts on how best to improve affordability of housing? And, and whilst we're on the topic of housing, I'll add another question from Brian Steinberg, who's asking, how do you evaluate the gray area of gentrification versus urban renewal? And perhaps I'll add here that, um, I know this is an area that Ronnie knows well, because Bridges Israel has been an investor in the impact here in Israel. So, please, right. so affordability of housing is, is a major, major social issue today. Um, a lot of people can't afford to live close to their work. Um, and there are solutions that are being invented uh, by entrepreneurs. Uh, so we're seeing co-living solutions. Uh, coming to the second question at the same time, we're seeing poorer areas close to the center of cities like uh, the Shapira area where Venn, to which you referred, uh, uh, started in uh, Tel Aviv, um, which can be upgraded. Now, how do you turn that into an impact venture? Uh, given the risk of gentrification driving out the existing population? Well, there are several ways that you can strive to do that, and then does. Uh, one is, first of all, you begin to improve opportunities for the people living in the area. They can create businesses, you support local businesses, you provide them with funding. Uh, so typically, uh, when a Venn um, area um, uh, starts to come together, there's a pizza restaurant, and there's a cafe, and there's a gym and there's a yoga place and you know and so on that's one aspect of it uh, a second aspect of it is co-living uh, you begin to design accommodation where you share uh, a, a kitchen uh, uh, among um, you know several uh, people uh, you know for for example and you reduce the cost of the accommodation for the population that is there you make allowance for a percentage to stay there and encourage them to stay and enable them to, um, to afford the rent uh, by subsidizing it uh, and, uh, and so on. And for that part of the population that chooses to leave uh, because of the rents are going up in the area, then you prepare alternative accommodation a bit further, further out. Uh, and so you begin to set objectives for, for yourself. You know, what percentage of the existing population do I want to remain? What percentage of the population that's going to leave can I help to rehouse in better accommodation a bit further out and create a model that does, um, you know, uh, both those things, doing good and doing well at the same time. And then you create a community, a community of young people who share an app. Uh, that app um, has mutual um, uh, service giving uh, uh, within the community and outside the community to people in, in need. Um, so I, I believe that uh, uh, the property area offers a lot of scope now for innovation in order to allow affordability and that uh, we can set ourselves um, objectives uh, that achieve uh, a social good uh, despite uh, inevitable gentrification. So you've mentioned one investment that you have made um, in Venn, in Tel Aviv, and Zaki Jamal asked the question that I'm very keen to hear your answer. What is the best impact investment you've made in Israel and um, based on what metrics? That's a tough <laughs> question because I have a portfolio of, uh, of uh, tech investments seeking to achieve um, impact. Um, I, I don't know which one uh, will turn out to be the best, uh, but I can mention a couple. 
Uh, take a company like Optibus. Optibus has developed artificial intelligence systems to help manage public transport better. Now, uh, if you manage public transport better, you reduce emissions, you can fit uh, the number of passengers to the vehicle, uh, you can save people time uh, on their way to, to work, uh, by scheduling uh, the arrival of, um, of, of buses or trains according to, according to the demand. Um, and if you, if you can manage to do all of those things and you measure the improvement that you're bringing, as well as create a, a unicorn, which I hope Optibus will become, um, then I think that's um, getting to the definition of a of a unicorn uh, in the impact area, which is a venture that isn't just worth a billion dollars, but improves the lives of a billion people as well. Okay, so we have time for just a couple more questions. So I'm going to try and uh, pick questions that are a little bit uh, out of the norm. But we have a question here from Harry Hatchwell, who sits on our SI3 Advisors Committee. And um, so he's very active in, in uh, screening actually the UJA impact investment field. And he asks, what is key to achieving balance when investing through a social impact lens? And do you have any tips for channeling emotions effectively? Uh, what do you mean by achieving balance, I, I, I would ask? Um... I think what Harry is asking is, when you look at an impact investment, there is the social element, which sometimes can be so heart-wrenching or so moving that it can um, skew your investment focus. And so he's asking, how, when you're looking at impact investments, you know, how do you channel your emotions effectively to ensure you still make a, a good investment? So I think, I think it's, a, it's a new game uh, to optimize risk return impact and you have to start putting numbers on the impact that you're trying to achieve in order to be able to play it to play it well uh, how many people are you going to help how significantly are you going to help them uh, and so on but sometimes and i've invested in a company like that called the uh, seven chairs um, you find the leader of a philanthropic organization who has been outstanding at helping disabled people uh, from memory 3,500 of them stay in employment. Um, and, and then he realizes that uh, building a philanthropic organization limits the number of people he can help. And so he decides to set up a new company, which he has called Seven Chairs, which is going to be a profit with purpose company. And the idea is that uh, rather as we're using technology during this webinar, uh, you have groups of six people and a moderator meet who are facing the same psychological issue, maybe as a result of an illness or a bereavement or some other crisis in, in life, a divorce. And so he's providing cheap uh, group therapy relative to what you would have to pay um, if you were doing it uh, you know, one by one, as it were, uh, in, somebody's, in somebody's office. Now, the business model was ambitious, um, but is a great a philanthropic entrepreneur going to uh, be able to make the transition to become a superb um, you know, uh, entrepreneur capable of building a, a unicorn? I feel so, but the jury is too far out if you're looking at it just as an investor. And so, like a previous question that you had about the 100 million, I say, okay, look, I'm going to make this investment because I think if we can provide and think about people in need now of psychological help through COVID, if we can help people's lives in this way, it doesn't matter to me whether the financial return is going to be stratospheric or not. I'm, I'm prepared to do it. 
But you have to be a bit careful uh, if uh, you're going to be doing this professionally and your performance is going to be judged by investors um, uh, in, in deciding whether to back your next fund. You've got to have uh, a, a, a set of principles that you follow so that you can deliver acceptable financial returns as well. So we have time for one last question. You have inspired so many people before the book and now with the book, myself included. And David Tosh has asked, which business person that you've met has impressed you the most and why? So I'd have to say uh, that it's the um, gentleman who gave us our big opportunity at the start of what became Apex. Uh, his name was Maurice Schlegel. I happened to be working in, in France with my partners uh, at uh, the time. Uh, uh, and uh, he decided to back us. Um, he had gone from being a messenger boy, uh, boy at one of the biggest banks, um, uh, Credit Lyonnais, uh, to becoming the CEO of, of the bank. And he was a man with extraordinary vision. In fact, the title of my first book, The Second Bounce of the Ball, um, comes from an expression he used to use uh, in, you know, in meetings when I was 24 years old or, or whatever. Everybody can see the first bounce of the ball. Uh, the skill is at guessing or estimating the second bounce of the ball. And so this man had such extraordinary vision, but had stayed so young at the same time that he would back a team of young people in their mid uh, 20s, um, you know, starting out on an ambitious thing. And a couple of our partners decided to leave at that time. And I went to a meeting at his home. And uh, he asked uh, the partners very presciently who wanted to leave, why do you want to leave? Venture capital is going to be so huge. Why do you, do you want to leave now? In any event, they left. But he had seen just how big uh, venture capital was going to be. So he combined vision uh, with, um, you know, with um, a fondness uh, for working with, uh, with young people and helping them uh, to become successful. And I suppose in, in some ways I've tried to do the same. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Thank you for taking the time this evening to be with us, to share your very super inspiring vision Wishing your book huge success. I really warmly recommend it to everyone. You can find it on Amazon. It's a super interesting read and really, I think, a must for the current period that we're in. And we all wish you much success and hope it creates the much needed change. And with that, I have the pleasure of passing the call over to David Cohen, the former chair of UJA, our host this evening, to give closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Dad. Thank you. Ronnie, I've had the privilege of uh, knowing you for almost 35 years and you've never failed to fascinate me. There's lots of adjectives that I could use, but I thought of four in particular. Your energy, your intelligence, your courage and your vision. Why your energy? Because as you say, going right back to those days in Paris and in venture capital, and moving on into so many other areas and private equity, philanthropy, and now spearheading this revolution, it takes enormous energy and you never, never appear to lose it. Then your intelligence, both your intellectual and your emotional intelligence, um, your ability to deal with all the different challenges that you've confronted and still confront um, speak volumes. Your courage, and I'll just be personal here for a minute, your courage in confronting illness and overcoming it. And I just wish you continued success, particularly on that front. And finally, your vision. This revolution that um, Dahlia has been so clinically and cleverly questioning you on, um, 
it really is a revolution. And having had the pleasure of reading your book and gaining more insights tonight, um, it's going to be fascinating to see where the revolution leads us. I recommend the book to everybody, but I think more importantly, I recommend that everybody pivot their thinking the way you've just articulated it, slightly away from the bottom line as we know it, and towards outcome. I think it's wonderful that you did this with UJA, whose own FII3 program is so pivotal to UJA's success. I think it'll be also terribly important for the people watching this to witness that. Dahlia, thank you for what you've done tonight, and to Louise and Mandy and Judy for organizing this. The outcome, let's hope it will be as good as we would all want. And meanwhile, Kolokavod Ronald, and to everybody else on the call, Lila Tov Kulam. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, David. Goodbye, everyone. Good night.